morning, everybody. Welcome to our message this morning, which is the first of our Christmas messages this year of 2021. I've called our series this year, He Came From Heaven to Earth. And the first message is entitled, The Light Has Come. The Light Has Come. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Just before we begin, I want to remind you that at the end of the message today, we're going to share in communion together. So you may like to pause it right now and prepare the juice uh, and the cracker or bread that we can eat and drink together in remembrance and in celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're beginning our Christmas series called He Came From Heaven to Earth. A byline would be Christmas according to Isaiah. You see, over 700 years before the first Christmas, there was a cry from those who wondered how much longer they would have to stumble around in the dark. Our theme verse is Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. It's important to understand some history first. So please don't check out on me. I'll keep it short and I think you'll find it interesting. In Genesis chapter 12, God selected Abraham to be the grand patriarch of a special nation. He became the father of Isaac, who became the father of Jacob, who had 12 sons. Their families grew and turned into tribes. These 12 tribes eventually settled in the promised land. The land God had originally promised to Abraham. Benjamin and Judah settled in the south around Jerusalem. The other 10 put down roots in the north. They were all united for many years, but when King Solomon died, a split occurred. And the 10 northern tribes split off from the two southern ones. The northern tribes became known as the nation of Israel, and the southern ones made up the nation of Judah. Now, it didn't take long for the northern tribes to turn away from God and begin worshipping idols. They became increasingly depraved and eventually made an alliance with Syria in order to attack Judah. As you can imagine, the people in the south were afraid. So God raised up the prophet Isaiah to give them hope. Isaiah predicted the northern kingdom would be destroyed by the Assyrians. And not surprisingly, this came to pass. And the ten tribes were decimated and dispersed to distant places. The area to the north in Israel was filled with darkness, distress, and despair. Now, while this is real history, it also describes what has happened to the entire human race. God made us to have a relationship with Him. But we've all turned from Him and served other gods, leaving us in deep despair and darkness. And so we get a picture of their situation in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. We read this, And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. As a result of their sins, God banished them by driving them away. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 15 describes a day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Because of their unbridled depravity, they were thrust into unquenchable darkness. Now our main idea today from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 is this. Jesus lights the way for those living in darkness. Jesus lights the way for those living in darkness. We read together Isaiah 9 verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, 
There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. May God bless the reading of his word to us today. Now, as we look at these two verses, we will see two movements taking place. The first one is this. Jesus moves us from great gloom to glorious gladness. From great gloom to glorious gladness. And we see that in verse 1. In the midst of grief and gloom, Isaiah announces a message of grace and glory. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. You see, Zebulun and Naphtali are tribes from the north of Israel, making up the land of Galilee. The territory of Zebulun was located near the major trade routes of the day. While this tribe fought valiantly in various battles, they also compromised with the Canaanites and descended into idolatry and immorality. The tribe of Naphtali experienced lots of struggles because of its proximity to Syria. The way of the sea refers to an international highway of that day that ran all the way from Mesopotamia to Egypt. For many years, these people only knew darkness and despair because of their depravity. God repeatedly warned them to repent. But since they rejected him, he sent the evil Assyrians to attack them. Because these tribes were the furthest north, they were the first to be attacked. Now, in the midst of this mess, Isaiah brings a message of future hope and healing. A time is coming when great gloom will be replaced with glorious gladness in Galilee. You see, friends, Christmas was and is birthed in the middle of great grief and deep darkness. While the angels were proclaiming peace on earth, Herod was preparing to annihilate infants. While Mary was worshipping, other mothers were weeping for their children. Christmas joy is best understood when the junk of life is all around us, just like it is at the moment. Gladness comes when we're grieving. Remember, Jesus lights the way for those living in darkness. The second thing is this. Jesus moves us from deep darkness to the light of life. From deep darkness to the light of life. And we see this in verse 2. And Isaiah uses the past tense to describe future events as if they've already happened. This shows us the certainty of how prophecy will be fulfilled. Specifically, how the birth of Christ will bring brightness to a world of darkness. We read the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. The idea behind walking in darkness is someone stumbling as they come and go. Watch this. While people are walking in the dark, all of a sudden a great light appears and shines into the deep darkness. We can't find the light on our own. So the light comes to us. In Isaiah 60 verse 1, we read, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now when we come to the New Testament, it's clear that Matthew, for example, had Isaiah's prophecy in mind 
when he wrote these words to describe Jesus. In Matthew 4, verses 12 to 14, we read, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, Jesus withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So Jesus left Nazareth. We read because he had no honor in his hometown. In fact, they tried to kill him. Now, are you ready? Are you ready for some spiritual goosebumps? Nazareth is where Jesus grew up after his birth in Bethlehem. Do you know where Nazareth is located? In Zebulun. Capernaum which became the headquarters of Jesus' ministry, guess where? In the land of Naphtali. The fact that Jesus grew up in Nazareth and lived in Capernaum is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9. Look at the next verse, Matthew 4 verse 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles. It's important to note, Galilee of the Gentiles was looked down upon by the Jews from the more sophisticated south, especially in Jerusalem. To them it was a place filled with hated heathen hillbillies. That's what was behind Nathaniel's question. In John 1 verse 46, Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? To think the Messiah would come from this region was beyond their comprehension. John 7 verse 41, they ask this question, is the Christ to come from Galilee? And in John 7 verse 52, they answer their own question, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. You see, actually, the Messiah had to come from this region in order to fulfill Scripture. Don't miss the significance of Galilee of the Gentiles. We're reminded that God's heart is for the nations, for both Jews and Gentiles. We're called to take the gospel to all people everywhere. I want you to see how Matthew 4 verse 16 applies Isaiah chapter 9 directly to Jesus Christ. We read, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Now darkness in the Bible is often a symbol of divine judgment. In Exodus we read, There were three days of darkness that could be felt in Egypt before the first Passover lamb was slain. And there were three hours of darkness, remember, before the Lamb of God died for the sins of the world. The ninth plague of darkness preceded the killing of the firstborn. And deep darkness proclaimed the death of God's firstborn son. Mark chapter 15, verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. From noon to three in the afternoon, it became pitch black. It was as if God the Father placed his hands over the sun and said, Son, you shall not shine on my son while he becomes the sin substitute. Now check this out. At the birth of Jesus, a supernatural star ascended to light the way for the wise men. At his death, supernatural darkness descended in the middle of the day. His birth announcement was a display of brightness at midnight. 
and the notification of his death was deep darkness at midday. Don't miss the good news here, friends. The region of Galilee that was plunged into darkness and death for so long was the first to receive the dawn of new light. Let me ask you a question today as we draw this to a close. Do you love living in the dark or do you want to live in the light? Do you love living in the dark or do you want to live in the light? John 3 verse 19 says this, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Friends, it's not enough just to have some light shine on you. Jesus calls us to repent from living in the darkness in order to receive the light of life. Now, it's common for people to believe that all religions are basically the same. You know, people picture God at the top of this mountain and we're all at the bottom and we say to each other, I may take this path up, you may take this path up, but in the end, we'll all be in the same place. What do we as Christians say? We say, what if I told you that God at the top of the mountain didn't wait for us to find our way up to him, but he actually came down to where we are? Most people say that would be great. We say, we believers say, this is the difference. What we find in the Bible is the story of God who has not left us alone to try to find our way to him. But he has come to us and has made the way open to us through Jesus Christ. So let's go back to our theme verse from Isaiah 64 verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Friends, God has come down into our despair and our darkness. Jesus lights the way for those living in darkness. He wants to move you from great gloom to glorious gladness. He wants to move you from deep darkness to the light of life. Are you stumbling around in the dark? Are you tired of living in the gloom? If so, it's time to make him room. Join us in saying, let our hearts, let our hearts be your home. You see, Jesus makes you an offer. The offer is found in John 12 verse 46. Jesus says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. What an offer. If you're living and you're tired of living in the darkness, it's time to repent. It's time to believe that Jesus died in your place and receive him into your life. Friends, this Christmas, let's encourage each other that the light has come. Let's pray, and then we'll share communion. Would you pray with me today? Jesus, I'm tired of living in the dark. I confess that because of my sinfulness, I've just been stumbling through life. I repent of the way that I've been living. Thank you for coming down into our world for dying on the cross as my substitute and for rising again on the third day. I believe that you are Lord and you are light and now I receive you into my life. Please save me from my sins. Be my savior and give me what I need to live under your leadership and your Lordship for the rest 
of my life. Now, Lord, we give you thanks today. Lord Jesus, that you came. You were born, you lived, and you died to set us free from our sins, from our bondage, from our darkness, and to bring us into the light of your glory. Thank you so much for the sacrifice you made for our sins, your broken body, your shed blood on our behalf. As we eat and drink today, we remember and we ask you to remind us of all that you've done, all that Christmas means to those of us who believe in the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before he died, Jesus met with his disciples. He took the Passover bread and he said to them, from now on, this is my body, which is for you. Let's eat it together with gratitude. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. How we thank him today that we are the recipients of the promises of that covenant. That we, who were not a people, have now become the people and the children of our God. Let us drink it with gratitude. Now may the love of God our Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor and our Comforter, be with us, keep us, as we celebrate once again this year the coming of Jesus into this world and forever. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye. <music>